Good morning, having your coffee with us on the show. Usually it's a uh, it's an adult beverage in the evening shows. That's right. Well, we're doing something new because Netflix decided to do something new. They dropped a, a surprise 11th episode of The Sandman, which I don't know. I You kind of saw coming because you saw an IMDb before the season even started that there were supposed to be 11 episodes. But yeah, and that's, was... how we pl- that's how we plan the breakdown of our, our actual review is on 11 episodes. Yeah. And then when they only gave us 10, it was like, okay, IMDb was wrong. No big <laughs> deal. It probably happened plenty of times in the past. Yeah. But, uh, a week later, we get this episode uh, called, I think, uh, a Dream of a Thousand Cats and Calliope. Two very Calliope, separate yes. stories kind of smashed into. I mean, we, we talked about episode six and how that was two distinct stories smashed into one episode. Uh, this is even more so. Very separate. Oh, yeah. This is two completely separate stories. And I was actually, when I found out that they did a Dream of a Thousand Cats, my first thought was, how in the how? world are they going to pull this off? Right. Because it's so so bonkers you know within the actual novel and they're like okay how are you going to adapt that to the screen so yeah that was weird and then Calliope I was all I was, I was pumped when they did Calliope I was like oh that's a yeah. cool story these two stories are so they're ones that you've read in the graphic novel yes in the comic collection yes. uh, but real quick guys before we get any further we're dad and rock if you follow us normally you know we do this kind of thing uh hit that like button hit that subscribe button let us know what you're thinking of when it comes to uh you know, the same man, if you're watching live with us, go ahead and comment live as well. We love that. And if you're watching, you know, after it's already been live, drop a comment as well. We respond. I respond to everything and uh, we'll kind of get into this. But let's continue talking about this. Sandman. So I'm going to uh, start. It's story time, everybody. It's story time. It's story Chris. time with Dad Rock. <laughs> I'm just going to go through what I captured here and do a little recap of these, the dream of a thousand cats. So the story starts out with this kitten. He escapes his comfortable little house with this uh, smoky street cat here. They're walking down the uh, English, um, I don't know, suburbs here, I guess you could call it. They meet in a cemetery with a bunch of other cats. Cats are getting a little rowdy. They're all here for some reason. Some mysterious figure is going to tell them a story. Um, And then the Siamese cat comes up uh, out of nowhere in the tree, uh, starts addressing the crowd here. And um, she starts telling this tale of when she used to be a domesticated cat. She had kittens. Um, the kittens ended up being taken by the, um, owner and drowned in a pond or lake. It's it's heartbreaking Um, how they did that. Man, that's just kind of messed up. One, one connection of these two stories in this episode, uh, humanity, not, not very nice looking. Uh, Oh, no. Examples of, uh, (laughs) humans not doing great. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Um, so she's, uh, understandably upset. Uh, she prays. Uh, to, I guess, kind of get revenge or whatever she prays to. The, uh, and she ends up, basically ends up going to sleep dreaming and meeting these figures, I guess, in, in the dreaming. Do you know of who, who these are, are supposed to represent? I, I don't think they were just kind of gatekeepers. I don't okay. think there's any real relevance to who they are because there, there's no real relevance to them in the story and like the actual novel either. They, they're referenced and they basically do the exact same thing that they do here in the show. Gotcha. Okay, so they let uh, the cat pet. It's so so funny because it's like I'm a cat. I speak for myself. Like, very. Uh, that's that that lines up with what I know of cats. And I know the cats behave. are very assholeish, and it fits cat. <laughs> that, that's a cat. <laughs> yeah, they're like you know. I walk my of, own path. What exactly? <laughs> they they do treat their humans as though you know the humans are there for them and solely for them. Um. So Morpheus as a cat, and I'm guessing with uh, Tom's voice here, this is definitely supposed to be Morpheus and cat. Yeah, that, yeah, that's Morpheus. That's that's a dream. It's, um, and it's again, it's one of the situations that she sees who she sees. Like he changes forms based on who is trying to talk to him. That makes sense. Okay. Um. So basically, he tells her, you know, the story of how it used to be, and I think what we see visualized here is kind of, kind of an interpretation of what how things used to be, because the way. I mean, once upon a time, humans were fighting for their lives against animals like giant jungle cats and stuff. You know what I mean? Like cats weren't domesticated. They were proud hunters and probably eating as many humans as they possibly could. (laughs) So even though this is an exaggeration of how big cats used to be and how small humans used to be, it somewhat lines up with how things were back in the, uh, you know, the the good old Stone Age. (laughs) The good old Stone Age. I club you in the head days. Yeah, but um, so she, you know, this is a world where cats ruled and humans were nothing. And, of course, it it eventually reversed and cats got domesticated. 
um, she tells this to this crowd of cats, and it seems like the overall consensus by then they're like, "Oh, we're, this is just some crazy, uh, yeah, you know, just, yeah, crazy, crazy cult old leader. cat lady." <laughs> yeah, this crazy <laughs> cat lady. Let's not listen to her. Let's get out of here. And uh, that was pretty much the end of the story there. Um, what, what do you what, think of this? As someone that's coming from the complete outside, when you seen this and you were watching this, what what were your what were your thoughts? I'm, I'm I'm really curious about that, honestly. I think Sandman is strongest when it's an anthology series like this. I mean, that was some of my favorite parts of the first half of season one, where how each episode was so different from the other episodes, and then the second half of the season they kind of followed one longer story arc, which I still enjoyed, but I didn't think it was as strong as the first half. I like. Sandman, I like the ability because you can tell stories like this. Yeah. With Sandman, like because he like we mentioned, you know, the the characters see Sandman as they would see him. So Sandman could take on so many different forms. Um, But any I think this story goes to show that, you know, Morpheus not only deals with humanity, but like whatever cultures there are, whatever dreams, right? Yeah. Cats, dogs, uh, aliens and distant planets. It, I mean, it whatever doesn't ha- matter what the, uh, who's dreaming. He's going to be able to interact with them. Yeah. Morpheus just be there. And then I think this is the first episode to really kind of hunker down on that notion. Right. Um, so I thought that was a good thing to do to kind of inform the audience, the Netflix audience of that kind of thing. Yeah. I, I think they missed, like you're mentioning there, I think they missed an opportunity earlier in the season yeah. because they gave us nada. And they gave him as Kai Cool. Right. If they would have given us that story at some point, I think they would have led that. more into exactly what you're saying here that this the, the episode of the thousand the, the the dream of a thousand cats gave us. Right. Um, as far as this particular episode, I thought the animation was gorgeous. Um I, I actually I liked it quite a bit. And I like Calliope. So spoiler alert, I thought this was a great episode. <laughs> yeah. Oh, cool. I no, dude, I love that. Uh this here. When I heard and found out that they dropped an extra episode, first of all, I did a backflip. Imagine yeah. it. That's interesting. Right. Uh, <laughs> but I was like, how, you know, Dream of a Thousand Cats, how are they doing that? How in the world are they pulling that one off? Yeah. So I, I turned it on and I knew the story. And then I was like, you know what? I love it. I love how smooth the animation was. Mm-hmm. I love the fact that they didn't try to make the cat's mouth smooth. I liked those more that there was, it was they were talking through thoughts. Right. Than actually actually talking to each other. Yeah. So I like the I like the story, even at the beginning of it, when you had that heartbreak where the kittens are taken and then they're thrown into the you know the, the river with a brick. The the heartbreak. I think there's yeah. one good thing that this this whole series has been able to give us in all the episodes is you feel something in every episode. No matter oh, yeah. if it's you know joy for somebody or if it's pain or Whatever the, the emotion will be, it always pulls some type of emotion out of you. And I thought it did great. Was even at the end of the episode when all the cats are leaving, mm-hmm. and the little one said, I believe you. And, she, and then uh, the other one, she basically said, Then little one, there's hope. Right, right. So you, yeah. you get that, you get that feeling as well. So it just, I thought that it, it, it pulled perfect from the emotional period of it. Yeah, so how does it compare to the... So I guess you read that story arc in the comics, right? Did, I Honestly, did it, I just finished it again. I, I was re-listening to the Sandman. Yeah. And I literally just finished that story when... What was it? This one in Calliope. I think I just finished this one in Calliope. It just it lined up perfect for me. So it was yeah. fresh in my brain. And I was like, you know what? It lined up pretty close. So another I mean, faithful it, adaptation then. Yeah, so the adaptation of this show to what the actual graphic novel is... It's yeah. been pretty spot on, honestly. Yeah, um, I liked it. Even the even the animation style, like you mentioned, I love that it was stylized, but it wasn't so it wasn't cartoony. You know, it wasn't taken out so it was so far away from an actual real picture. Like as I was going through these frames and capturing these pictures, any any one of these could be like a painting you could just hang up. Oh yeah, easily. You know what I mean? Like look at I these. love that. Yeah, that one there is one of my favorite. When you see how big he is and his glowing eyes. Yeah. Or when he actually stood up for the first time when he was on like the actual, like, uh, I wouldn't say altar, but his perch. Right. And he came down. I thought that was fantastic. Yeah. They're, they're very painterly. Yeah. I thought it was cool. I thought it was great. Um, Okay. So then we'll move on to Calliope. uh, Another story here where we get to learn of a new, new character. I say new character, but Calliope has been in 
the uh, the realm of human uh, uh, literature and history and storytelling for you know centuries and thousands of yeah, years. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, so Calliope, another character here in the Sandman that apparently has had run-ins in the past with Morpheus. Um, what do you think of this story? Uh, no, I enjoyed this one, and I enjoyed how they tiptoed around some of the things that were unkosher. Yeah. And I, lo- I loved how they, they they walked away from it and they let you connect the dots. So they didn't have right. to worry about doing anything that may upset people on screen and alienate some of the, the fan base. Uh, but they, they followed this pretty closely, too. Oh, yeah. The adaptation. Yeah. So the adaptation of this one w- was pretty close to what it actually came down to uh, before. I mean, the ending's a little different because I don't remember exactly the ending of the the graphic novel compared to the way this ended. Yeah. But it wasn't anything that took me out of it. Uh, Richard Maddox is, uh, I guess, teaching a college uh, course here, but he's an author. He's had one hit on his hand, and he's struggling to write a second uh, book, a follow-up. He's already two years into borrowing money from a publisher to get it in and get it done, and he hasn't written a single word of this book. So he's in bad shape. He's He's a stressed guy. Um, he eventually goes to this other successful writer that apparently the only reason he was successful is because he had Calliope, a muse trapped, um, much the same way that uh, Morpheus was trapped in, um, and it was happening almost simultaneously. Did you catch that? Yeah, I did. Yeah. A lot of this happened at the same time. And, and honest, I'll I'll be straight. I mean, I'd much I'd love the novel. I didn't draw that connection. Oh, I didn't yeah. really realize that until they they played it out here, right? It on uh, on the show. Um. So yeah, he ends up basically inheriting this muse, this uh, older writer. Um, uh, what was the guy's name? Aramis Frey. Aramis. Uh, what is it? Aramis oh, Frey. Fry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fry. Aramis Frey. Yeah. He ends up giving up the muse, and you know, Richard, you're hoping that he's, you know, it's not. Well, he it's gave not him. A... I'm it's... sorry. Well, I'm just saying, like, he inherited this muse, but this muse is like, you know, was held captive. <laughs> yeah. And, and the old author, Fry, was like, you know, don't be fooled. It's not human. It's it's supposed to, you know, this is what it's here for. Hundred years old, hundreds of years old. But yeah, but the reason that Fry gave him to him was he brought him that, like, uh, a hairballish thing. Yeah, what was that about? Didn't get uh, any more I, of that. I, I don't remember. Honestly, it, it has something to do. There's There's got to be some type of mystical powers or something around it. The day there's a whole bunch of different types. This one here was a was basically a hairball from someone that had uh what was it called Rapunzel syndrome? Yeah, that disease. Yeah. So, yeah, I guess it was kind of a swap. You get me this, I'll give you her. Yeah, that was very interesting. I wouldn't well, be surprised. You know more than I do, but little one-off scenes like that sometimes in the show they end up leading to a whole separate different story. Um, which I don't know if that's the case in this case, but it's funny how they'll just touch on something and drop very something very interesting and then just go away from it. and just go away from it. And they, I think they led a little deeper to it actually within the graphic novel. Mm-hmm. I think for time restraints, mm-hmm. they kind of cut, trimmed a little bit of that out, yeah, uh, for the actual show itself. So Richard starts by kind of wooing her, giving her gifts, you know, trying to entice her to, be, you know, be a muse for him and give him inspiration to start writing again, which doesn't work because she's like over oh, this. Like she's sick of, you know, writers are liars, ad- admittedly, by by Fry. And she's like, she's over this. She doesn't want to do this um, until eventually the Netflix once again kind of takes the source material and something that was very dramatic and heavy and sort of uh, not glosses over it because you get the idea, but they don't show anything too graphic to where yeah. it's they let you be, They let you actually use your intelligence and connect the dots. That's a good way of putting it. Yeah, it, it knows how smart its audience is and you can connect the dots. Yeah, Because you can actually go back to where he meets her, Calliope, for the first time. Because Calliope's in Fry's house, locked up. Fry walks in the room and he said, what are we doing now? Is he our audience? Right. That right there should be enough for you to know what Fry was doing to get his actual, you know, inspiration. And then what happens fast forward when Calliope's here with Rich, uh, Richard Murdoch. And yeah, Richard, I was I was rooting for in the first part of this because I was like, OK, now that you 
are in the circumstance just do better like almost like free her like the genie like in aladdin you know what i mean like just give her the wish free her immediately and maybe she'll you know be thankful and and want to help you out a bit after the fact like you don't need to be a scumbag like fry like your predecessor just like do the right thing up front and even as he continues to make the the lesser of two choices he just keep, keeps going down the hole and so eventually at this point it's it's pretty irredeemable Oh yeah, no, he yeah, he gets well past the point where he's a redeemable character. Yeah. And he's just living it up. He's finished his novel. He's, you know, other ideas. He has, you know, everything going, money, everything, fame, yeah, movies, everything is going his way. But here are he your favorite it. characters. They're they're reappearing in different form again. Yeah, the fates are back in uh, you know, Greek, uh, maybe Roman mythology too, which Calliope comes from. So it makes sense. You know, she's praying for help. The fates show up to uh, talk to her, and it just makes sense in the theme of, and the content, uh, you know, the continuity of the show because we've seen these ladies before, so that's cool for them to reap it. Very, very, um, very different set of circumstances, and they even look different. Things are a little brighter here in this dream. <laughs> well, yeah, in this instance, they're sisters. They're not so much the, f- they're not considered the fates. They're considered like Calliope's sisters in this, uh, in this uh, environment. Yeah, and I love how they drop that little uh, mention of uh, how the endless, even the endless, are having a tough time these days. Like, yeah. oh, we know all about that. Yeah, because in this in this aspect, the endless that are having a tough time is Morpheus, who is captured. Yeah, which Calliope kind of learns of through the sisters here. Um, so basically, the the fates are telling her, "Hey, sorry, sis, there's not much we can do here. You're going to have to help yourself. You and know Morpheus the rules. You are bound by law." Yeah. So you got to figure it out. You figured your way out. Yeah, figure it out. Um, she wants to, I guess, write to Morpheus or there was something about saying his name aloud, um, which he does because he's like Morpheus. And I don't know if that unlocks something to where that would be the invitation for him to. That's kind of a throwback, honestly. If I pause it for a second. Yeah. To the house, the dollhouse. Yeah. Where. uh the fillers green or uh i forget his name what was his name in the show um oh anyway human form of fiddler's green yeah yeah gave rose that and he said if you're in a hard spot say his name okay and when she said his name in the novel that's when she he came to her aid when she was in a bad spot at the serial convention okay so this is kind of a throwback to that story without and it's, this is one of those things that is a Easter egg for people like myself that know of a little bit more of the story. Right. I see. Oh, that makes sense. And I, and I kind of got that through the actions here, but that helps uh, give it some clarity. Um, so he does. He ends up tossing that note in the fire. He thinks he's home free. Um, Morpheus does show up, though. They have a nice conversation. You learn a little bit about their previous history. So Gilbert. I only. Who was it? Was it Gilbert? Oh, it was Gilbert. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Fiddler's Green. Yeah, Fiddler's Green human form, Gilbert. Um, okay, so you probably know more about this than maybe the show even lets on. But so Calliope and Morpheus used to be husband and wife at some point, right? See, this, I'm, I'm honestly, you're going to give me a little more credit than I think I deserve in this aspect. Okay. Uh, I'm a little foggy on this. I'm a little foggy when it comes to their relationship with their with the child. Uh, this is more I need to look into because I'm not 100% certain exactly what even happened to the right. child. Right. What I gleaned from the dialogue and as it quickly as it went by, because like we said, this show just kind of you know expects you to pay attention, which I like in a show. Um, but through their their exposition here, apparently they were married at some point. They had a son by the name of Orpheus who something happened to the son. I don't know if the son's still around. But something happened to split these two up, and there's been a long era of uh, not forgiving each other. They basically have been mad at each other for like a millennia or whatever. Yeah. Um, and this, and she, she's remembering the Morpheus of the past. Apparently, you know, before recent circumstances have changed and evolves, uh, evolved Morpheus's kind of sense of self and his place in the universe um, with being captured by Roderick. Um, he used to be pretty cold, pretty distant, uh, which you still kind of see that he's fighting with in this show. Um, but this is a new man that he's talking to, a new, well, a new uh, eternal or new uh, entity. What, what do they call him? Endless? A new endless. The endless, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so he's a little softer that. and kinder with her now. I love how they show his growth yeah. as a character. And it's not, 
it's not one of those like over the overnight like completely it's, different character right it's subtle it's yeah it, it, i think it's more real honestly yeah. Because no you, one changes overnight. You may right. you may be fighting with those changes for years, yeah. and you know, and fighting with your old self. And you see it within his interactions and everything within this whole episode. Yeah, like we talk a little bit later here. He says, you know, when she's freed, he does something, and she's like, "Do you want him to die?" Like he's willing to kill him essentially. Oh, for sure. He's willing yeah. to do whatever he needs to do to make things right for her because what he just went through. But she says, "No, free him." Yeah, he's paid enough, and he he, he essentially does it. So it's, uh, I, yeah, I, I love the actual character arc and growth that we see within Morpheus. Yeah, and I agree with that totally. And I think there's even uh, just an, another layer too. I was reading an article after I watched this episode actually, uh, where it was talking about the original graphic novel, the original story that, you know, this was based on where, you know, Calliope, essentially, she doesn't have a lot of agency. Like she's kind of victimized throughout the whole thing. And even Morpheus, he kind of comes in, you know, white knighting the whole thing. Like, uh, come in, I'm coming in to let me save the day. I'll, you know, I'm angry and I'm going to get revenge on this guy. And that's kind of it. Um, when I like that the show, there were some changes in the show in this episode once again, Neil Gaiman, he wrote this thing 30 years ago, and he's grown as a person since then, right? So he wanted to include, well, let's give Calliope a little bit more agency and, and say into what happens with her and with um, this Rick guy going forward. Yeah. And Morpheus even asked her, like, he's like he's he tells her, he pleads with her, let me help you, please. So it's kind of it's like it's up to her. Like, I want to do something about this. Will you let me? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that yeah. Kind of thing. Um, which he does. He ultimately I does. I love this scene. This What's, scene this here for like a me, horror movie. Yeah, this scene here made the sh this this episode for me. So uh, the whole episode itself was fantastic. Yeah, but the fact that he walked in, Morphe is just sitting at his desk. Yeah, and he's like, "I'm not calling any human and you know, you know, organization or anything. I am taking care of this." <laughs> yeah. And he starts. Well, he said well, he can't let her go because. She's giving him his ideas. It's, oh, ideas you want. Right. I'll give you ideas. It's like the monkey's paw. It's like, be careful what you wish for. It's like, I always I always zone back to that episode of The Simpsons. It was a, a treehouse of horror where Homer Simpson's in hell. And the demon's like, oh, you like donuts, do you? And he just starts machine force feeding him donuts over and over again. <laughs> and Homer's just like, uh, and he like breaks the machine because he just keeps, you know, he, he won't stop. And he, the demon's like, well, what do we do? I don't know. Um, I see, I, another thing about this this, this scene I like mm -hmm. is it, it goes back to Morpheus. The character, yeah. the the actual, you know, casting of him was fantastic because he can oh, play yeah. somebody more lighthearted. You you seen the lighthearted episode when uh, it was a uh, with Wait, Dream episode smile. six, yeah. And you know you've seen that part of him there, and then you see the super menacing, you know, horror like character yeah. that he can play right here and now in this episode and essentially this shot here you got right. so it's i think they did a fantastic job with him they did yeah and every episode just like reaffirms that over and over again like just like spot on casting so good and neil gaiman knew that from the get-go like uh that's that's I and everyone so much... was concerned even you were concerned when they showed the first uh, shot I, when he was going up in the light and it looked like uh, you know a twilight boy <laughs> oh yeah i'm over all that that's when i was ignorant about this stuff <laughs> Um, so this is ultimately what happens with, uh, uh, Rick here. Um, he is doing a lecture. He starts going off with idea after idea where he can't control himself. They're just spilling out of his mouth. He ends up kind of running out of the hall and he doesn't have a pen to write all this stuff down. So he starts, you know, writing on the wall with his blood. He's going nuts. He's going cuckoo. And, uh, everybody is kind of like, Ooh, yeah, um, everyone's like really concerned for him. Well, yeah. They, <laughs> they, they get him back to the race. hospital. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, they get to the hospital and then um, a woman who previously he had been teaching at that college course that actually was the one to give him that uh, magical hairball. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, she's with him again and he, he asks her, hey, he's like, you got to go back to my apartment and, uh, you know, free this woman. And when she does the, you know, Calliope's not there. It's just a book. I didn't, get, I didn't get a good sense of what this book was. Did you? What was it was the oh, the candle, the, some type of candle. It was the, it was one of the books that Fry wrote that was really popular that fell out of print. And he said, oh. if there's one thing you can do for me going forward, 
is convince your your publishers to reprint that book. And he didn't do that. He, no, he, he didn't. He forgot. He he heard about it later. Oh, he died. Oh, he committed suicide. Oh, well, this is like, oh, I guess I should have uh, should have gotten that guy's book out. I, I forgot. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that was a mess. Once so, again, yeah, that's that's the book. That's the reference okay. that took place there. All right. So Calliope, she's uh, she's free. Finally, after so long, she has another discussion with Morpheus here. They talk a little bit about um, their past. Uh, she even asks him, like, you know, would it be OK if I stop by the dreaming to talk about our son and grieve properly? And he's not ready, basically. But that was understand. awesome. He didn't say no. Right. He said perhaps he said someday. just not now. We're, yeah. he's, he's still going through the problem. I think he's he's in such flux when it comes to just himself right now because he just went through 100 years of captivity yeah she just went through 60 plus years of captivity right. they're both reflecting on what's going on and what was important to them and he's like okay maybe at some point like even to nada mm. nada he, he told nada no he wasn't even free nada from hell right so yeah. i i can i can see all that i i, I can I, like i said before the growth in the character and the personal relationship he's he, they're showing him have between Calliope, Nada, Death, you know, uh, Desire, mm -hmm. all these other characters that play a big part in his life and how he reacts and emotionally. I mean, even uh, uh, his, uh, man, I'm blanking on her name, Librarian. Uh, I know the character. I It was just last oh, week we watched this show and you're, man, why am I blanking out of our head name? already? It's because we have Game of Thrones coming on tonight. That's what it is. Yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah. even her. Lucian. Lucian, thank you. Wow, I feel embarrassed. Uh, <laughs> even Lucian, you see his emotional turmoil he's yeah. dealing with. Right. So, yeah, I know I've said it a few times already. It's just how well they went ahead and they portrayed this character and how much he's changed from when he was released from Burgess to the end of the show. And I think it's twofold, too, right? Because it's like... Not only is it f like filling out Morpheus's backstory and character and giving us these nuggets of the interaction with him as far as him progressing as a character and the story arc he's going through, uh, but also they're saving it for later, possibly. Who knows what comes down the road? You know, I actually maybe... I, I went out on a limb and I tweeted right at Neil Gaiman. Oh, did you? Uh, yeah, I was like, since we got a dream of a thousand cats in Calliope, will we see facade? And a midnight summer dream, because they're mm -hmm. the last two real stories within that that group that they told us. Yeah. So there's only two more, and I'm figuring the next season is going to be like uh, it's a dream of a thousand mists or dream not dream a uh, season of mists or something like that. You're so it's a whole another <laughs> yeah, it's a whole another set of things going forward. Yeah. So the only loose ends with this set of stories are those two. And it's not like Netflix, not or not like it's not like Netflix to just release one bonus episode. Yeah, Netflix is notorious. They're not very good at letting a show grow and develop over time. They'll give a show one, maybe two seasons to find an audience and then they cut it no matter the quality. It could be an excellent yeah. show. But if it's not getting them traction and numbers and pop culture, you know, uh, currency, yeah. then they'll drop it pretty quick. Sandman, though, I think delivered pretty hard and heavy this first season. A lot of folks were talking about it. It seemed to be a crowd pleaser, even with his original audience and people coming to it in, you know, new who had never and read we're the books. A good, we're a good look at that dynamic. Yeah. See, um, I knew that I knew the content and you didn't know the content. And we both ended the yeah. season both favorably looking at it. So neither yeah. of us were like, yeah, that wasn't any good. So a lot of fan um, fan pleasing, but a lot of critical appraise, uh, uh, applause too uh, for this show. We'll definitely get more. Netflix is going to be bringing this back. You're going to get more uh, adventures with this cast and Neil Gaiman. I don't want. I don't want to wait two three years though. Don't I know, give me that right? much time between. Yeah. Well, but I mean, if it keeps the quality, this this was a quality season of television. This was a high so quality season. Yes. Sometimes we got to wait a little longer if we want that quality to continue. But when it does, we'll be here. We're Dad and Rock. We cover shows like this all the time. We do trailer reactions. Uh, coming up on the Dad and Rock after show, we will actually be covering the new season of uh, House of Dragons, the Game of Thrones prequel coming out to HBO and HBO Max tonight, actually, as it's premiering. We are going to cover that uh, when? I what believe next weekend. Next yeah. 
the 28th will be the coverage of that. And then also, yeah, it'll be, it'll be pretty much just that. And then we'll be also covering, you know, the Lord of the Rings, we'll be covering Andor. There's going to be a lot of things that we'll be covering going forward. Yeah. So uh, it'll be more of a recap for episode two for uh, House of the Dragon leading you into it. So join us for that. I mean, we're always fully interactive. We love interaction. So anything you can add to the show is highly uh, encouraged. But hit that like button. Hit that subscribe button. If you make sure you don't want to miss us, hit that little bell. I mean, we, who hits the bell anymore? But uh, hit that too. And uh, I, I guess until we see you then, we'll, what can we say? You know what? This is Sweet Dreams. There you go. See ya. <laughs>